Okay, good morning, and welcome to Christ the King, Wilmington, and to our Facebook friends. Uh, we're uh, going to do something different today. Uh, we're going to be uh, interviewing my good friend here, Dan Young, and uh, we'll go through some of the ground rules in a minute, but uh, I would like uh, to begin with a time of prayer and ask God to, uh, to bless this time. Father, thank you so much for uh, loving us, for caring for us. Uh, Lord, we, uh, we realize that uh, this work we're involved in here at CTK, our little part of it is building your kingdom. It's not building our kingdom. It's not building our brand. It's not building anything about us. It's about building your kingdom. Therefore, we need your, your help. We need your impact on people in order to do that. And I, I know that you want to, and I'm, uh, we're believing that is what you're going to do. But we pray that you will bless our time together. Uh, today in this uh, little different format that we have uh, to present to people. Uh, again, thank you for all you've done. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I wanted to, uh, we're doing something a little bit different today. Uh, this is Dan Young. He is uh, part of CTK Wilmington, and uh, he's also a uh, real estate agent and broker for HER Realty. Successful, I think. Are you successful? Depends on who you ask. Oh, it depends on who you ask. Okay. Uh, I've known Dan for seven, six, seven years, maybe, I guess it is. And uh, so uh, one of the reasons I wanted to do this today uh, is because we're taking a little break for the month of October from uh, our uh, uh, Hebrew study. And uh, so uh, last week we had Kim Ryan here. Next week we're doing Hands and Feet of Jesus, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then the following week, Cliff Tatum was here. And so we had this one week. And I wanted to get Dan up here and um, and have him tell his story. Uh, Dan was an uh, an atheist, and uh, an atheist is what? Someone who does not believe there is God. Uh, we use the word agnostic. What's an agnostic? One who's not sure. Not sure if there's a God, and uh, and they're sometimes confused. Right? Am I correct so far? My dad used to say an agnostic is someone that just doesn't know what to do on Sunday. Okay. All right. but he was an atheist. He was an atheist. <laughs> so uh, Dan has uh, has come uh, full uh, to a point where he's not only not an atheist anymore, he's a devoted follower of Jesus Christ. And so I wanted him to uh, uh, share his story. And I believe it or not, I am going to shut up here shortly. But uh, what we want to, to do, this is going to be an interactive time. And we have, are, you guys are on the computer too, right? Or not? You're doing homework. <laughs> okay, she's doing no homework, <laughs> which is okay, <laughs> which is okay, and um, yeah, she goes to college, and she's uh, here, and she's here, yes, it's fine, this could be very boring, actually, I don't know, we're still paying attention, well, we're looking forward to what Dan has to say, yes, we are looking forward to what Dan has to say, so in other words, shut up, yes, anyway, Beth will be, is on the Facebook, and if you have a question, you can ask her questions, anyway, let's begin, um, just, Tell us your story of growing up and, and what that was all about. Right. Well, I, I guess uh, to quote the Grateful Dead, what a long, strange trip it's been. Because uh, it's definitely been a wild journey. But uh, uh, so, you know, turn the way back machine back uh, in the uh, 80s there when I was a child. I grew up in an atheist household. And I, you know, really, I guess, suppose that's not very uncommon unless you're in, in the area here. It seemed like uh, everyone I knew was a Christian. But... Uh, my, my father was a devout atheist, uh, where, it, you know, I, I grew up hearing such things as uh, religion is the stench in the nose of mankind, you know, these were very common things I would hear, and, uh, and so on and so forth, and, uh, but it was kind of interesting, though, that even though that it was an atheist household, it was, uh, it was uh, I had probably the most picturesque childhood you could imagine. It was the most loving household you could imagine. I had you know, a loving family, loving friends. So when I say it was an atheist household, it's not like we were uh, slaughtering goats in the backyard or anything like that. It wasn't. Uh, sometimes I think that's what people picture. No, it was incredible. But interestingly, not uh, interestingly enough, though, that um, I look back and I think of all the ways that God has worked in my life, even uh, and especially as an atheist. Uh, an example: He surrounded me by uh, some really wonderful Christian people growing up. And which, in retrospect, now I understand how important that is for us as believers, right? Um, an example, uh, you know, my, my neighbors, uh, the Coomers, uh, they, they were all Christian, and, you know, we were always spending the night at each other's houses and that sort of thing, and so we wound up going to church with them on Sundays. 
didn't know what it was about. You know, I'd be invited to, to church camp uh, by some other neighbors. And as a matter of fact, I, I earned the nickname in church camp as Dad and Thomas. My, my father was very proud of that fact. Because everything that they said, I would, I would say, oh, really? Are you sure about that? So I'm surprised I got invited back there. But um, I had uh, uh, other friends, like, like the, the Sheltons, my best friend Matt Shelton. Uh, uh, they were uh, a Christian household. And, and his mom and I uh, uh, became very, very good friends over the years. And she actually was a, a great spiritual influence on me. So... You know, yes, I had this incredible childhood. Uh, I had, uh, here's the cool thing about Dad, though. Uh, he was very open. He's like, you know what? Th these are my beliefs. You go find your own beliefs. Th these are mine. But, you know, he was a very strong personality. Uh, he was the patriarch of the family, and so I really kind of filled those, those, you know, those shoes, in a sense. Uh, I can remember my, uh, my brother, late 80s, uh, going to Florida, he was kind of a wild child, and he went down to Florida, and then he comes back with a cross around his neck and accepted Jesus. Uh, that old boy, you know, Dad, this isn't going to go well with Dad, you know. And it didn't, but Dad said, you know, you can pick any superstition you'd like. That was kind of his response to that, but my brother held true and was saved. I later found out that my mom was saved early on. She was just, a, I guess, a silent voice in the house. So she was a Christian as well. I didn't even know it until in the later years. Uh, my sister as well, you know, it was just kind of, you know, dad, I guess, maybe had that strong personality and it just, you know, we didn't go to church or anything like that on Sunday. So that was, that was kind of the, the foundational piece. And uh, you know, as I went on and, and uh, uh, I was always questioning, though, constantly questioning, okay, good, bad, or indifferent, what, what does this mean, what does that mean? And I, I'm sure a lot of you have, have, have prob prob probably been in the same place. Uh, but then I went on uh, to the service, and I remember in boot camp, uh, you know, for any excuse to get out of uh, the daily grind of boot camp, I, I had this, this guy, uh, last name Beard, he says, Dan, you ought to go to church with me this Sunday. I said, yeah, I, I think I'd rather polish my shoes, but thank you. And uh, so about the you know, fourth or fifth week of boot camp, I'm like, my church sounds pretty good. Uh, I'm going with you, Beard. And uh, now, now Beard grew up black Baptist. So, you know, when he took me, he took me to the service that was, it was spirited, let me tell you. Uh, they were dancing, and, you know, uh, it was just, it was a really different experience for, for this guy, I can tell you. But it was, it was, it was just one of those things that I think kind of, in my psyche, kind of put it, put it in the, the memory bank there. And then went on to the service, and then Desert Storm came around, and, and you've heard the old saying, there are no atheists in foxholes. Well, it's true, I prayed to God, you know, but my prayers were... God, if you do exist, uh, you know, this would be a cool time to know it. You know, but, but nothing really really came of that. Um, got out of the service and uh, went back, and, and uh, Dad was having some health problems. I, I was actually, I changed my residency to California. I know, boo. I was going to go to UCSD and, and go to school there, but Dad had some health problems, so I came back to Ohio. I lived with him, and we started a little business together, had some fun with that, and... Um, but then I started going to uh, this Baptist church with, with uh, my friends, the Sheltons and the Coomers, and started attending there for a while. And, uh, but, but that's kind of uh, where things started to solidify. But here's, here's what's weird that made me open to go into that church. Uh, when I, I was stationed in, in Hawaii, I know that was the, the tough duty, right? Um, I was stationed there, and I started studying martial arts. Weird place to start finding Jesus. Right? Started studying martial arts, but with that I started studying the Shinto religion, which then led me to Buddhism. And it's, it's interesting, looking back now, the more, I, the more you look into Buddhism, it's Christianity. And, and I don't mean that in the way that uh, go study Buddhism and you'll be saved. No, I'm, I'm not saying that, so I don't want anyone's hair to get on fire on that one. But it's just interesting how the, you know, Buddha was all about the love and, 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 and whatnot and, and his teachings about love and how to treat your, your, your fellow man. Um, and so I'm, I'm hearing all these teachings. And then I started studying a lot of business stuff because I wanted to start a business at that time and, and, uh, before I got out of service. And part of that was studying Zig Ziglar. You, you know Zig? Mm -hmm. You've heard of Zig? It's an old Zig. Uh, he, he's, he's since uh, left us. But um, Zig, uh, he was a big influence on me because it was more personal and business growth. And uh, one of my biggest issues, when I was an atheist, I, some of this looking back, I was probably just echoing what my father might say. 
But I used to complain about the hypocrisy. Right? We've all heard that, right? No, what, Christians are hypocrites. Yeah, they say one thing, they do another, they're just hypocrites. Well, Zig Ziglar kind of put that to rest for me when he said, a hypocrite is someone who complains about the sex and violence on the VCR. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess you'd have to modernize that now, right? On, on their Netflix. Um, so when you think about that, it puts, really puts in perspective. There, really, there, is, there, there are no more uh, hypocrites than anybody else on the planet. So. Uh, but Zig, uh, Zig started taking the, you know, filling my ears with the, the, the business stuff and then the personal stuff and how exactly do you have meaning in life and so, you know, all this stuff and it, it all just started adding up and I'm, I was, I'm an, always was and still I'm a very uh, avid reader, love to read. I, I'm a learner, you know, so I'm, I'm constantly reading, studying, reading, studying and the more I read to try to really uh, dispel or, or, or I'd say build on my beliefs as an atheist, the more I realize that uh, there's, there's just something not right about it. There's got to be something bigger, right? And then, of course, later on when you start reading scripture and, and we find out that, that God puts uh, you know, a law code in our heart, and so we, we secretly, we, we're always seeking the Father. Even if we're not a believer, we're always seeking the Father. Hmm. And uh, looking back on that, I can see where he really, that I was starting to feel that. That's, I think that's what fueled me to seek it more and more and what led me to Buddhism. And then I had to start reading the Bible directly. And then that's the funny part. So when I started reading the Bible, and, and it's, it's particularly the Gospels, I had a devil of a time, so to speak, with, with the Old Testament. It just did not click for me. It, was, it just seemed like a book of fables. And, but when I read the New Testament especially the red letters, right? I guess you could say I was first a red letter believer. Uh, it's, it, it really spoke... Explain red letter. When Jesus spoke it. Okay. So in the Bibles, yeah. a lot of the Bibles, they outline what Jesus spoke and read. Which is fascinating, by the way. I later had a seminary professor who said, at some point in your life, you're going to make the determination that you either believe the red letters in the Bible or you believe the whole thing with equal prominence. But that's, that's for a whole other whole other sermon. Um, but... Uh, and so I, I, I uh, started reading the red part, and I find, wow, this, this, I love this. This, is, this really feels good. Uh, and so then I start going to church to start learning more about this, and that's when I was out of the service and, and then you know, living with Dad and going to this little Baptist church uh, with, with uh, uh, Pastor John Holbrook, a uh, great, great man. Uh, he, he just, he's, you know, you're, you're, you're just your Baptist preacher, preaching from the heart, preaching from the soul. And uh, uh, he really... Uh, really started to put the pieces together for me in, in the sermons. Got me more and more curious about Christianity. But then God starts speaking to me like, you know what, it's, just, it's time to come home. It, it's time to give your heart to me now. And I'm struggling with it. I'm like, if I give my heart to you, if I come home to you, I'm not going to have a home over here because Dad's going to freak out because I was living with him at the time. And uh, so I was struggling with that. And this went on for a long time. And I'm sure... There have probably been a lot of people out there that had this. They can feel that tug and they can feel it. They can feel it. But for every reason on this world they can think of, they're like, I'm afraid to give into that. And that's exactly what happened. But then one Sunday I was just overwhelmed. And, and I, I didn't have that. Like, my whole story is about gradually, 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 then suddenly. I didn't have that really bad event that, or, or, or something that and just, people come to Jesus for different reasons. But mine was just this gradual, 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 gradual. All of a sudden, one Sunday, it's not like they had a revival. It's not like the, uh, the, the music was any different that day. It was just another Sunday and another sermon. And I'm just like, okay, God, I give in. Boom, let's go. And uh, I, that's, that's the day I, I uh, was saved. Uh, you know, and a, a week later, Brother John dunked me. So I baptized. And uh, then I'm like, okay, now what? How, how do I tell my father this? It was like my, my little secret. As a Christian, you know. and uh, uh, the, the sad thing is, I never did tell him. I, he's not stupid; he figured it out. But he was polite enough not to bring up that conversation. But in retrospect, I think well, what a missed opportunity I had with my father, you know. And, and we can't we, we, we can't miss those opportunities. Um, but uh, but so that's when I was saved, right? That's when I gave my heart to Jesus. But I can tell you that's that's just when my my walk began. Uh, so how old were you when you made when you were saved? I was uh, twenty eight. Okay. Yeah, twenty eight. So, it was, um, but the, I, I think the 
I still went on with, with uh, you know, uh, drinking and the partying and, and, you know, all the stuff that was fun. So, yeah, I was saved, but nothing really changed in my life. But here, here's, here's the strange part, though. Up until I was saved, I had this tremendous, like, peace of mind. You know, I, I, I don't know if it's from the meditation, the studying uh, the Shinto and the Buddha and, and, and the martial arts or whatever it was. Um, I just had this peace of mind, like, happy-go-lucky, everything's good. And I get saved, and all of a sudden things start changing in my life. I'm starting having some, some struggles. And uh, just, you know, just bizarre. And I got to the point where, and Brother John, Brother John will attest to this today, I, I went into his office furious. I went in and I, I slammed the door and I, I said, Brother John, we got to talk. And he says, what's going on? He said, well, before I was saved, everything was, you know, it was good. I was happy. Everything's great. Ever since you dumped me, my life has gone to crap. And he looked at me without missing a beat and said, Dan, who told you being a Christian was easy? He said, you got to understand that up to that point, the devil had you in the bags. He didn't leave you alone, let you do your thing. But now he knows you're a threat. And I thought, well, what kind of threat could I be? Yeah, but it's, it, you know, it's just a, but it, it always just, just stuck in my head. And I realized that, you know, there, there is a struggle there, right? There is a struggle there. But that's, and as, as time went on, I started studying more and more scripture, get in, in more depth, and, and um, uh, then, uh, you know, Eric and I, uh, we started going to uh, Christ Church at Mason, and, and uh, we're going through some, some these different classes, and, and now, you know, we're getting the, the kids in church and everything, you know, fast forward, you know, uh, a good 10 years, I guess, at that point. Um, and uh, it, the interesting thing is, uh, I just really wasn't sure about, about my journey or anything like that as far as I'm just going through life. But then I started going, getting uh, depressed, just like really horribly depressed. And to the point where, where Erica says, you know what, you, you should speak to the church counselor. I'm like, well, that's I'm not really a counselor kind of person, but okay. Uh, I'll give it a try, you know, if nothing else for, for the family. So I go and I talk to the church counselor. I'm not in there, what, 15 minutes, half hour, something like that? And the church counselor just almost immediately says, have you been called uh, to... to uh, to uh, uh, the service of the Lord. Have you been called this sort of leadership or, or anything like that? I said, well, yeah, I, I keep on hearing this feeling like I should be doing some leadership or should be doing something, but look, man, I'm the sinner sinner. That is not my bag. And he says, well, how long are you going to keep denying this? And I said, well, I, I guess I'm done. And I made that decision that day that I was going to move forward with, with, and be obedient to God. Uh, the next thing you know, I was in seminary. And by the way, the depression lifted uh, almost immediately. It's not like I, you know, since then I've not had. But, you know, it, the heaviness, the heaviness of knowing that I was not fulfilling God's purpose. Because, you know, once we're saved, uh, you know, the, the Bible teaches us that the, the Holy Spirit dwells within us. It's guiding us. And it, 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 there's, there's nothing we can do to stop that. And when you're going against the Holy Spirit, you feel that too. And that's what was going on in my life. I was denying the call, denying the call, and, and that, that heaviness was just upon me. So I don't believe that it was Satan or anything like that. I think it was just God saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep making life difficult until you figure this out, Gene. You're not unlike a you know, didn't child. So I uh, went to seminary, and uh, it, that was a struggle. Right? Because and This is not that long ago, right? No, this was uh, 20, 2014. 20, something like that, right? Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. When, when, when God said, okay, uh, time for you to go to, to seminary, um, and, and, and you know, for those of you watching or listening, I do not have the benefit of God like talking to me directly. There are some folks that have that. I do not. Perhaps I'm too stupid, too thick-headed. I don't get that. Usually it's just going in the wrong direction, getting pounded and realize kind of like a rat going through a maze and finding the cheese, right? I'm, I'm probably more mouse smart, but, um, uh, or too stupid to quit. Maybe that's the better analogy. But, um, you know, I, I'm thinking to myself, I cannot believe I'm going to seminary because I did not grow up reading the Bible. To this day, I'm not the kind of person that can quote you, like earlier when we were talking, and where, where's this script? I, I couldn't uh, uh, 
quote the scripture, but I knew it was in Luke. That was the best I could do. I know where to find it, you know? I've never been the kind of person that can just quote scripture, regardless of how hard or study it. it it's mm-hmm. Monty Python, Google's okay, I'm an good amazing there. Tool. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I can quote you Monty Python, but for some reason, scripture really, really has to stick. But, uh, uh, yeah, so I, I'm thinking to myself, uh, what am I going to do? I'm going to a school where these folks uh, are, are probably unlike me, where they've had some background, right? They've probably had their four-year degree, and my four-year degree was in business. So, okay, uh, what do I do? God at work. I get to Cincinnati uh, <coughs> Christian Seminary. My very first class was a class called Assimilation uh, and Involvement of its Church Members. And the professor there was Dr. David Roadcup. I mean, uh, one of the, 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 you talk about just God in action, right? Put, put, putting uh, Dr. Roadcup and I together. He was the first person that actually said, you know what, you've never been discipled. Come on, let me, let me show you how to walk with Christ. And the interesting thing about this mm. class was this, that up until that time, I had grown real estate brokerages. Yeah, so that's what I knew. That's, that was my life. I knew business. I knew how to grow real estate brokerages. Only to find out that there's just so many similarities between growing a brokerage and growing a church. And so this class was perfect because I was able to take the knowledge that I had in the secular world and convert that into growing a church. It was just amazing. So that was the very first class, and it gave me the confidence uh, to, to move forward. And what are the odds? Because I'm also told that that was one of the tougher classes, and, and I want to write in my, my paper and for you, you do a, a big capstone paper. I want to do on that too. But. So that is just one of the many instances where God has put someone in my life uh, to help me through and, and uh, I really grow deeper into Christ. Any questions? I have two based upon. I have two comments. Okay. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Frederick, I can't see it now. There we go. Says, um, trying to get back to the comment here. Yeah. Anyway, he said the absence of but the the absence of God is is the definition of pain. The absence of God is the definition of pain. Yeah, I think that's what it said. I can't yeah. see it now. Is by uh, definition pain, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. by definition pain. It's a friend of yours. Frederick somebody. Frederick Duff. Yes. Ah. yes. Hey, and, hey, uh, Brad. A, a young lady by the name of Miranda says, "Hi, Daddy-o. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, two questions, hi, hi girl. Two questions that come to mind based upon your uh, your com- your story. Uh, all of these people in your youth that were Christians that influenced you. Mm-hmm. It sounds to me they weren't preachy; they just loved you. They were just the opposite of preachy. Okay. Yeah, they're just the opposite of that. Just no matter how stupid or what I did. Uh, they just loved on me, and, and just they were living the example. Yeah. Which thought, uh, brought to my mind this idea that you know we we're at different levels in our Christian experience. Some are more outward, outgoing, and others are not as uh, able to do that. But no matter where you are, you can have an influence yeah. on people. You don't have to be a preacher or teacher or anything else yeah. to have a powerful impact. Yeah. The other thing is you talked about purpose, and you yeah, he and. Uh, Chris and I were at uh, Jen's on, on Friday for our Friday meeting. By the way, 9 o'clock, anybody wants to come. Um, Great food. And you talked about, if I remember right, you'll remember this comment. You made this uh, comment about people wanting to find purpose in life. Yeah. And then you realize it's not about us finding purpose in life. It's about God's purpose. Yeah. Right? Yeah, uh, expand on that idea. Yeah, so I was listening to a, a Robert Kiyosaki podcast, if any of you have heard of him. Rich Dad, Poor Dad, that sort of thing. And uh, he has this habit of at the uh, just throwing out random things because he's, he's very real about things. And so I, I throughout my, my uh, professional uh, life, I've gone through a lot of coaching programs, a lot of seminars, stuff, the other thing. And we're constantly hearing about what's your purpose? What's your big why? What's your purpose? What's your big why? You can't live. You can't exist without your big why. And I, honestly, I was tired of hearing it anyway. Mainly because I don't know what my big why is, and it's frustrating enough. I don't need to be reminded every day about what's my big why. And Kiyosaki just threw it out there kind of as a side note. You know, quit talking about your purpose. Your purpose doesn't matter. What's God's purpose for you? 
you know, in, in his example, he said, I teach financial education. Do you think I really enjoy teaching financial education? Is this what I really want to do? No, it's not. But I do it because that's what God wants me to do, and God has rewarded him greatly for it. So I think it is very powerful, mm -hmm. and, and Eric and I were talking about this as well. That, yeah. You know, it's, 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 it's a struggle, though. Okay, does that mean I can't have fun? Does that mean, no, it doesn't mean any of that. It just means be careful. The question you should be asking is God's purpose for you. And I, it, my feeling when, when I heard that, it was like this burden had been lifted, like I, I, can, I can quit seeking. So I, I was telling Eric, Dad used to always say that the meaning of life was that wet owls fly at night. Wet owls fly at night. You can write that down if you like. But I wouldn't, <laughs> because here's the, here's the point. Dad said, it, I said, well, what does that mean? He said, absolutely nothing. That's the point. Quit chasing it. Just live life. And in this case, live life for God. Very good. Any other? Uh, go ahead. I'm curious what profession your dad was in. He, he, uh, he was in the, the banking industry for years. And then from about the 80s on, uh, he was self-employed as a consultant to the collection industry and banking industry. Okay. Any other uh, questions from the group here? Or? Yes? Oh, are you just waving? <laughs> How did you and Erica get together? I think that's important. Yeah. It is. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, uh, high school sweethearts. Yeah. So, uh, met through. Uh, actually, so it's not like I didn't go to church when I was in high school, right? And actually, I wouldn't have met Erica if I hadn't been going to a church. I was going to a, 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 a Lebanon church in Nazarene. I met a friend through my friend Matt, met Doug, and wound up meeting, meeting her. Uh, but I was in church for all the wrong reasons, right? There were women there. There were uh, two girls in church, so that's why so I went I to church. The lovely Mrs. <laughs> so that's, that's the way God works, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Preach it, and I'll turn the pages. <laughs> <laughs> so were you dating while you were in the military? Yes, yeah, we, we actually were married. Okay. Yeah, and then we, uh, we actually got divorced and then remarried. And that's a whole nother... Uh, that's next week's so. <laughs> <laughs> We're running out of time. Right. Uh, I, like, I like to say that's our Jerry Springer story, but it all works with a happy ending with God. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. what's your second one? What's that? Your first and your second one. Uh, first and third. Oh. Since you're going to bring it up. That's part of the Jerry Springer story. Sure, sure. <laughs> you're going to the Jerry Springer story. She's a troublemaker, I'm oh, telling you. <laughs> no, so technically my first and third, yeah. No, yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. You want to expand? Well, oh, come on, I told you this story. Yeah, you told, you told us. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, I wasn't yeah. listening as usual. It turns out you're right. <laughs> he doesn't right. listen. Do you still follow any of the, uh, like the new atheist movement as far as like Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins, um, Christopher Hitchens, the late Christopher Hitchens? Uh, are you, I mean, it's because of your background being as it is, mm -hmm. uh, the four horsemen, um, you know, just kind of watching their movement, and uh, you know, I've, I've kind of kept up with a little bit of that. And William Craig, Lane Craig, which is a Christian perspective, and uh, just the different um, arguments that the new atheists bring to the table, which has been super influential for people moving away from Christianity um, and embracing atheism, you know, and, and agnosticism. Uh, I just was curious because you have that background. Do you still keep up with, with that, that, that line of thinking, or? Well, yeah, I'm always, um, so I'm always challenging my thinking, always. And things that I think I know, things that I don't. And do I keep up with the, 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 the atheist teachers and the teachings that are out there? I do for one reason. Um, I, I've always liked the field of apologetics, which is really defending your faith. Uh, I've never been sharp enough or educated enough to be uh, a, a, a uh, one that is really good with apologetics. I would love to be. Um, but I love to see what the atheists are thinking and what their movement is. Uh, let me, let me, I'm a cave, simple caveman, so let me keep this caveman simple. Um, Zig Ziglar used to say that he liked to read the newspaper and the Bible because he liked to know what both sides are up to. Right? <laughs> And I see it the same way. I still like to study what they're teaching. So I know what are the false teachers teaching out there when we're trying to reach the lost? What are they hearing? Because their, their message is usually very logical, very simple. So we need to make sure that we're following along 
with a logical and simple response to it? That, that's a great question. Well, I don't like what you said about how your family, because uh, I have a, some very dear friends that are you know, staunch atheists and have moved away from Christianity. And, uh, you know, what your initial point is certainly noteworthy about it was a loving family that you grew up in that, you know, did not acknowledge that there was a God. And uh, I think that's important. I, I think that's important to note, hey, that, you know, it, you're not saying that these people have thrown all caution to the wind and they're just, you know, flying out of control in society. They're, they're still loving people. Yes, and, absolutely. Uh, they need the gospel. They need Christ. Right. Um, but I, I appreciate that what you had to say there. You know, and here's what I would say to the, to the atheists, uh, having, you know, come around, is that I look back at, at my life as an atheist and think, how empty. It seemed so full, right? Because the world, this is Satan's world, right? We live in a fallen world, and this is his place. And he can make us feel like we're, we're full with, with things and, and, and possessions and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But when I look back, I think, how sad that I did not know the love of Christ when I was a child or a teenager or in the service. How many missed opportunities did I did I uh, miss uh, as well along the way? Mm -hmm. You know, all, all that missed love. Yes, I had incredible love for my family and friends, but there's nothing that compares to the love of Christ. And until you've experienced that, you've got nothing to compare. Mm -hmm. So I would say to an atheist, unless you actually have given Christianity a try, you have no foot to stand on anyway. You don't know. You just don't know. That's a, that's an excellent point um, that Kayla brought up, and I was thinking the same thing when you were talking about your loving home. And when we present the gospel of Jesus Christ <coughs> to people who reject it, it, they're not bad people. They're not they're not evil people that are doing horrible things. They're good people who just reject the message. So I listened to a radio host in Cleveland who is is not a genuine Christian. He is one of the most generous, money-fundraising, caring, compassionate people on the radio, raising millions of dollars for, for people in need. And, uh, and he doesn't really believe in Jesus, so that was an excellent point. Dave. When uh, you were in the Buddhist stage, did you get into mindful meditation? Yeah, so... Uh, and, and did that influence the way you approach meditation and prayer now? Oh, uh, okay. So I guess I could hear it. The question is, when I was studying uh, Buddhism and whatnot, and, and when I practice the meditation, uh, does it impact how I pray now? Is that fair? Uh, it does. It absolutely does. Uh, because I did learn some awareness. Um, but I will tell you this, and Paul and I have talked about this several times, I still struggle with my prayer life. I, it, it's it's a uh, work in progress. It's not like a destination. It's a journey, right? You're always working to go there. I still struggle with my prayer life, um, but the meditation and, and, and what, what I learned and what I'm coming around to again by studying Buddhism and the meditation, especially maybe even more so the Shinto religion, was that in, in that search for enlightenment, uh, you learn how to find the inner self and quiet the inner self down, and I've actually forgotten that over the years, and it's just something I'm getting back to. So there's a lot to be learned from other religions. I, I, would know I, I I don't look at it as like that religion's wrong that religion's wrong I, I look at it as um, but we need to have our relationship with Christ because that's that's eternally <laughs> the right thing to do but you can certainly learn from other religions and practice some of those things uh, last weekend I think you and I uh, both uh, believe it was it was kind of a highlight in our experience when Kim Ryan was here and uh, we talked about it, and, and uh, from a personal standpoint, this week has been an amazing, uh, it's been an amazing week for me personally. Uh, we talked about this as well, and I, I thought, uh, I won't mean to embarrass you, but I know you left uh, last Sunday with tears running oh, yeah. down your face. And uh, just what the impact of last Sunday meant to you. Yeah, yeah, that, that, uh how many of you felt that, that last weekend was just incredible? You know, right? Just incredible. It, it's amazing how God sends out his, his people uh, like that. And, and in, in my case, it was very timely. And it, 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 there, there are no coincidences. Um, we had talked about how I, 
I've been struggling with, uh, I go through these valleys. It, it's not like you're saved, and if I, at least not in my experience, you're saved, and all is great, and you and God are walking through the garden, you know, if you knock, it, it's just, to me, it's just not there. My, my uh, communication or that feeling, that presence of God is, is kind of like this for me. And admittedly, as in a valley, I'm, I'm, I've, I've struggled with why, am, why is God not talking to me? Why am I not hearing him? Why am I not feeling his guidance or his presence? Uh, is there something in my life? I'm on, in, what's the connect, disconnect? Uh, and wow, when, when he came in here and shared uh, how, uh, first of all, his closeness with, with Jesus and how Jesus literally gave him the vision and spoke to him. Uh, and and, uh, and as, as we talked, you know, 20 years ago, I would have thought that was nuts. Now I get it, and I'm envious of it. And that was my conversation with him. I said, I'm feeling this disconnect, and we prayed together. And it, it was, it, I could just, just it, it, walking out of here, and know it's not a chemical or emotional thing. It is real when you feel that Holy Spirit. And I walked out of here, I felt changed. And so, I was, even my prayers changed this week. You know, I was praying instead, uh, you know, Lord, uh, I don't, don't, don't take the fear away from me. Give me the courage to overcome fear. Uh, Lord, don't take the obstacles out of my life. Give me the strength and courage. Uh, Lord, uh, what, what, I want to hear you. I want to be obedient to you. And do you want me to share that, what happened there? Yeah, share your story from Wednesday. Yeah, I'll make it real fast, yeah. real fast. Yeah. Uh, so Wednesday, I, I'm, I'm Wednesday morning, going through my, my, kind of my, my new, newer morning routine, but getting up earlier and, and so on working out whatnot, and um, I'm, I'm praying, I'm praying, Lord, please, I uh, want to hear you speak to me, you know, I'm praying and praying, and crickets, nothing, I'm like, all right, I get it, so, uh, got showered, and I'm, I'm getting ready to head out, and I thought, you know what, normally I go to this location, today I'm going to another location, so I just, just kind of one of those things, like, I think I can make it in time, I'm going to go, and I went, and I'm glad I did because, uh, no coincidence, as I'm walking out of that location, someone darts out of a room and says, hey, uh, I've been wanting to talk to someone about a, a career in real estate. Now, that's not where I'm going with this. Like, thank you, God, I have another agent. No, that's not where I'm going with this. <laughs> uh, I put her in touch with one of our managers in that location. And the manager calls me back shortly thereafter and says, you're not going to believe this. She was praying for somebody. Uh, she... Uh, She's praying and praying uh, to someone of faith she could talk to. Uh, and uh, she looked in the room, and I was kind of in a row of people, a row of managers, and, and singled me out, said, I, I, I think I need to talk to this guy. And as soon as I walked out of the room, that's why she said she, she told her she had to muster the courage. She came darting out of there, and, and you know, when she talked to me, I said, well, I have to be the right person. Now, God didn't speak to me, but he did put me in the right place at the right time. So I, to me, it was a testimony to, yes, God is very active in my life. He puts me in the place where I need to be uh, to help his people. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite, uh, well, a lot of favorite stories, but to illustrate this, God speaks to people in different ways. Uh, I do believe God speaks to Kim Ryan the way he does. He doesn't speak to me that way. Uh, but I love the story of Miriam and Aaron. We talked about this. Miriam and Aaron uh, are, are rebelling against Moses because he married the wrong woman. And God sits them both down. I love this picture. This is in my mind. He sits them down. And he says, look, here's the deal. To some I speak through visions and dreams. To Moses I speak face to face. In other words, I'm going to do it. God's going to do it his way. And, um, and uh, he, he doesn't appear to me. He doesn't speak audibly to me. I do believe that he does to others. But he does lead us. And the thing that transformed me, and we're going we're gonna to wrap this up, and then I'm going to give you the final word. One of the things that I came away this week, this and watching the, the, um, the Sheep Among Wolves and the church where Kim works in India, where thousands of people are coming to Christ. In Iran, thousands of people are coming to Christ. And I asked him, why is it that God is working in India and Cambodia and Iran and China in these miraculous things miraculous ways, and I don't see it in America. And he made a profound statement. All they have is Jesus. That's all they have. And I got to thinking about what is it that I have that I do every day that I really need Jesus. There isn't a whole lot. 
Now you can say, well, yeah, but he's there to guide you. Yes, but so much of what we do, and he talked about his church. He said, our services were so organized, and the music was so good, and we had all of the overheads, we had all this. We didn't, we didn't have time for Jesus in, in the church service because we had it all managed. That transformed me for the fact that I'm now praying to God and consistently now, and I'm going to try to be consistent this week, to pray for God to pour out His Spirit on us and on this area, that we might see hundreds and thousands of people come to Jesus. Because I can't do it, right? I can prepare my messages, and I think this has been a great time we've had this morning, and last week was a great time. We do the best we can. We talk to people. We pray. We do all these things, but unless Jesus does it, we can't get anything done. And to just say, and you know, I'm all into this timing of God, you know, pray for people to be healed. Well, if God chooses not to heal them, that's his business, but I'm going to pray for it. Pray for Caleb's friend. Been praying for him a lot this week. Uh, God heal him. Praying for God to change lives, Right? Pray for God. And I, I want to read, this is the story we were talking about earlier. And I've, been, I've been arguing with God. I, I listened to Moses argue with God in, in the wilderness when God said, I'm tired of these people, I'm going to kill them all. And Moses says, what are you doing? You can't do that. And, and says God changed his mind. Uh, but I love this story. Jesus, he told them a parable to the effect that they had always to pray, always to pray and not lose heart. In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused. But afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice. Picture that, okay? And then he says, uh, and, and so that she will not beat, down, beat me down by her continuing coming. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will, God, will not God give justice to his elect who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Here's the point. I'm going to beat on the door of, the, of God and bug him. To do his work, right? This is his kingdom. It's not our kingdom. We, we have the name of our little church, Christ the King. Uh, but we're not building Christ the King Community Church. We're not building that brand, right? We're building God's kingdom. It's, it's the tool that he's given to us to reach the world. And unless he changes lives, it, they're not going to happen. So I'm going to bug him. And I remind him, I start saying, Lord, you said in John 15 that if, you're, if I abide in you and your words abide in me, that we're going to produce fruit. I said that. Listen, read uh, Solomon's prayer when he dedicated the, t the temple. He said, God, you promised us this. You promised us this. And this is not a prosperity Christianity, right, where you're going to be wealthy and healthy and, and all of these things. But I think it's time to bug God through prayer. Your final thoughts, and then we will be done. Uh, my final thoughts, so to the believers, that, that nobody is insignificant. Uh, we play a larger role in the kingdom than we probably ever would imagine. Uh, make sure that you don't hold yourself up and, and, and keep to yourself. Make sure you get out and share the love, because it really, it takes, it still takes a village to raise a child, and can you imagine if I didn't have the village? I had an incredible family, but imagine if I didn't have that village. And, and not to say that my life is even going to be that significant, but what if I'd spark a fire that does something amazing for the, for the kingdom? You just never know what kind of impact you're going to make, and God has a plan for every one of us. Right? And, and to those that, that are lost, if you're feeling that tugging, like, yeah, I, I get it. I look at the leaf on the tree, or I look at, I look at the amazing things that God has created. I know there must be a creator, creator and I just I, I feel like I'm embarrassed to go for it. Just... Let that all go. Follow your heart. If you feel it tugging, surrender yourself to Jesus today. Don't wait another day. That's the best possible advice I can get you. And surround yourself with, with, with good people and, and, and not necessarily believers. Our goal is to, to reach out, right? We, we, we want to be fishers of men, not keepers of the aquarium. So get out and, and, and go out and, and, uh, and love on people. Show them the love of Jesus.
Final questions? Dave. Oh, Lord. <laughs> you know, I, I say all for the end. Is your dad still with us? He is not. Are, okay, so were you able to convince him about Christ before he died? I'm so glad you brought that up because one of the <coughs> missed opportunities. But when I look back, it's for instance, when my brother came back and he was very sheepish about letting my dad know, so was I. So uh, I may not see my dad again. You know? And I, that was going to be my yeah. next question. It, it's very real. Now, I don't know. My dad could quote the Bible like anybody. Okay, He knew the Bible inside out. I don't know where his heart really was. Uh, and who, who knows? So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll get lucky and, and see him. But look at scripture. Probably not. Just don't. Don't miss the opportunity. Okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's so important. Well, what was part three? Because those two were tough. <laughs> you answered it by crying. <laughs> yeah. Yep, that's just the, that's the reality. You know, uh, a lot of people, you can pray people that have it. No, you cannot. You have to personally accept Christ as your Savior. It couldn't be any plainer in Scripture. So we can't miss that opportunity to be the hands and feet. And, and we don't we don't save people. We bring them to Christ so they can have their relationship. And I missed that opportunity. I should have been braver. Love you, brother. I was going to ask you to pray. Do you think you could pray? I'll do my best. Okay, that, okay that'll be good enough. <laughs> uh, Heavenly Father, we we thank you. Uh, we thank you for being our, our guest today. And Lord, we we ask that you bless everyone here and everyone that's that's listening out there. And, and to uh, those uh, and, and may this may this video go out to those folks that are on the fence and just don't understand, and they take that opportunity. May this be an opportunity for those to witness to the people that they want to witness to, but they feel fearful of. Uh, don't take that fear away, Lord. Please give them the courage to overcome that fear. And uh, Lord, we are so thankful for your grace and your love. And, and, and unbelievably thankful and grateful for the people that you put into our lives. And uh, Lord, it's, it's in your precious name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Before we go off Facebook Live, just to, to say that next week we will be gathering at 10 o'clock at 2004, 2004 Center Road, Center Road, uh, to work on, um, to help around the house of Tom and Sue Shuttleworth. And uh, we will be there at 10 o'clock. Uh, we have some, we need some, uh, we need some ladders. Okay, we got to trim a tree. Um, she's going to provide some brushes to paint her door. I think we ought to also maybe bring some paint equipment, some rugs, uh, rugs, rakes and hose. We don't need rugs. Uh, we're going to uh, clean, a, a trim some things, uh, some edges Make along. Some rags. Yeah, and, uh, and clean out a uh, flower, flower garden. garden. Now, I don't know whether or not we need to haul some stuff off from that uh, or whether she has a place we can put it. If we need to haul it off, we can bring it over to our house there and put it on our burn pile. Uh, so at 10 o'clock, come. We have people that are not a part of CTK that are going to come and help out. They wanted to help out. They watch on Sundays. And um, Sue uh, warned me. Uh, Tom, I actually worked with him years ago, uh, has dementia. So there's a chance he may... Uh, be a little cantankerous. I said, I said I'm a truck driver. We deal with that every day. So, so don't worry about the way he uh, talks to us. Uh, but anyway, and then after that, we're going to go out for lunch at uh, Rod's Capricorn Inn, and uh, so that's what we're doing next week. The following week, uh, Cliff Tatama and his wife Karen will be here. They're arriving Friday night. Uh, we are going to have a bonfire and cook out over at our house. And we're also open, uh, we'll, we may take them downtown, not exactly sure what we'll do downtown. We want you all to come if you want to just hang out with them. And then he'll preach on Sunday, and then Sunday after church we'll go to Buffalo Wild Wings, and he'll experience that. And he's here to help us in our, in our journey uh, as a church. So I want to put all that out there on Facebook, and you'll be sending out an email on what we need and we'll be promoting on Facebook Live. So at that point, we're going to say goodbye now to Facebook Live and, and then uh, continue our service together.